Okay, so uh, a little bit of review. If you have your book, that's good. If not, that's okay. Um, if you did your book, it was chapter 5. <clears throat> We're talking about the offices of the church tonight. Uh, we took a little break last week. It's been two weeks since we were in our study, and I know some of you uh, maybe were gone uh, even that week, and so just a quick recap of what we've been talking about recently. Uh, you know, we've definitely transitioned from the church DVD history of the church thing uh, into the last five weeks <clears throat> talking about the church in general. We've talked about the marks of the church, what, what makes the church um, uh, the church and not, you know, some kind of country club, some kind of uh, recovery club, uh, whatever, whatever things can be. Um, what are some of the things you think about? What, what distinguishes a church? What are the marks of a church or what makes a church, you know, a biblical church? Any thoughts on that? Five solas. I know it's a long time. Five solas. I love that answer. Yep. Five solas. Good. And in this in this study that he has been talking primarily about, um, anybody remember? Uh, purity, right? Unity and verity, right? So purity, unity, and the truth. And we've kind of been he's been kind of unpacking how those things apply in all these different aspects of the church. And so we've talked about, um, you know, the makeup of the church, uh, the marks of the church. Um, last, I think the last time we were here, we talked about, remember, even the power and the discipline of the church. Uh, does the church have power in my life? Uh, does the church, and some would say it has too much authority in, in the life of a believer, uh, forgiving sins, telling them what to do, you know, other types of religious things that can be like that. And some would, uh, I would say some have too low of a view of the power or the authority that the church should have in my life, saying, uh, you know, the church doesn't have any authority over me. I can go where I want to go. I can go when I want to go. I can do what I want to do. You know, I can kind of make church however I want to make it. And, uh, and so we talked about a lot of that. Uh, we talked about church discipline, remembering, uh, you know, what the Bible says about church discipline. Remember, we went to Matthew 18. We went to many other texts to see uh, the steps of church discipline. Uh, you know, anybody recall some of those? Somebody maybe can walk us through that as we're reviewing and setting the table for today. Uh, church discipline, is it important or no? Why, sh why do we have that listed as, as an important part of the church? Or is it an important part of the church? Keep it pure. Oh, good. The purity, of the purity of the church. Good. I think it helps people with their sanctification process because it can be tough. Yeah, it can definitely be tough. And definitely the unity we want to be united in the truth of god's word the purity is yeah to purify uh, and keep keep the bride as pure as possible and so when there's an issue um you know it's got to be taken care of and so remember how uh, matthew 18 kind of unpacks that uh you know we kind of really see five steps of if you will church discipline of you know confronting the person personally uh that that has maybe sinned against you if it's a brother or sister another believer um, you know, and then if they don't listen, it says if they listen, then, you know, and repent, then you've won your brother back. Uh, that's, that's always the key, right? The goal of church discipline is restoration, reconciliation. And so, um, you know, the second thing, if that doesn't happen, it would be confront with witnesses. Remember to take, you know, two or three witnesses along with you so that they can also be a part of that. Uh, still desiring for restoration. If that doesn't happen, then it says to take it to the take it to the entire church, take it to the congregation uh, before them, so that they would they would know what's happening. And so, you know, we. Oh, okay, got one on before I got to mute them. I didn't know who it was, but we'll see. Um, to take it to the church and make it public, so that you know now everyone knows what's going on, so that maybe others can reach this person still aiming for reconciliation, right? But also on the threshold of if they don't respond to this, what's the next step? Excommunication. Um, so, you know, they are no longer considered a member, no longer part of the church. Um, and then, you know, the fifth step past that would be disfellowship. That, uh, you know, as, as we looked in 1 Corinthians 5, you know, it's a punishment to purify, to say, you know, don't, it said don't even eat with such a person. Uh, don't hang out with them anymore. Uh, totally disconnect from them. And, and why would that be? It seems harsh, right? So for those who weren't here, maybe somebody else uh, tell us who remembers. Why would we uh, disfellowship and excommunicate and do that? Why would that be a part of it? It does seem kind of harsh. Like, I'm not supposed to eat with them. I'm not supposed to talk to them at all. Why? 
what do you think is the intent there? So they will turn from whatever sin or whatever they have done. <clears throat> okay. If it's not, then maybe they weren't. Yeah, good. John says that, right? Yeah. John says, hey, they went out from us, which shows that they were never among us, right? Um, yeah, good. So, yeah, to, to, to purify it, because if they aren't a believer, then you're just kind of weeding out the, the tares from the wheat uh, so that there's no bigger issue. And you're showing the, the rest of the church this is important, uh, and everyone else sees what's happened and how it's going. Uh, and also, if that person is a true believer it should bother them. It should hurt them that they are not able to fellowship now with their family. It's like getting kicked out of your family and now you should be hurting and want desiring to be back with your family, which should drive you to repentance and the things that need to happen. Yeah, good. Okay, well, I don't want to spend too much time as I look at 6.45. Um, so let's kind of go ahead and get into tonight real quick. Um, Craig, would you mind grabbing the lights real quick? Can you turn the light switches off right the back there for me, buddy? Thank you very much. Uh, tonight's, uh, you can see, is the offices of the church. Uh, so as we start, I just want to uh, start by saying uh, Greg is uh, Greg Dully is up there on the screen. He wasn't able to be here in person tonight. Uh, super glad for him as he is one of our deacons. Uh, you guys know that Brian and Steve and I have been the elders here. Uh, Brian obviously has left. So we currently have two elders and one deacon. Uh, so just to kind of keep that in mind uh, for the church here as we get into the office, and the officers here tonight. Uh, I bring that up to say I'm super grateful for Greg and for Steve, and uh, you know, but but certainly uh, we need your prayers as uh, you know we continue to be men who are called to these things, and, and we'll get into it a little bit more here tonight. But uh, thank you, Greg, glad you're able to be here tonight, and certainly glad for all you do, brother. Thank you. Feelings mutual. I wish I could be there in person, <clears throat> but it's better for you that I'm not. <laughs> all good. Thank you. Here we go. Christ has said, I will build my church, and that church is a local assembly of saints. But Christ did not design that assembly to be without leadership. So we must go to the scriptures and discover how the church is to be led and who are to be the leaders of the local assembly of the saints. And when we go into the scriptures themselves, we learn in Philippians 1, verse 1, that there is a plurality of elders and a plurality of deacons. In other words, we learn there's two major offices that are sanctioned by God and that churches need to have to be functioning properly. It, it says, Paul and Timothy, bond servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are in Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. And see, Paul's addressing the church that met at Philippi, and he's not just addressing the saints, He's addressing the leadership of this church. And in that leadership, we notice that there are two primary offices. He uses the word bishops. And that word literally means overseers, those who oversee the church. And he uses the word deacons. And that word literally means servants. So we have overseers and servants. We have bishops and deacons. Now, when we think about the position of an elder or a bishop. There are three major words the Bible uses to describe this office of an elder. We have the word bishop, we have the word elder, and we have the word pastor. The Bible uses three words to describe the same office. Now it's a mistake to separate these three words as if they're distinct separate positions. This is what happened in the early church Ignatius, who was a disciple of the Apostle John. And he was arrested and eventually martyred. Supposedly he was arrested and took, was taken to Rome. And when he was in Rome, or in the journey to Rome, he wrote seven letters that we have today. And in those seven letters, he distinguishes between pastors or elders from the bishop. And in so doing, creating three separate offices, deacons, elders, and bishops. But when we go to the scriptures, we see that the scriptures do not make a distinction between a bishop and an elder. In fact, we notice this in 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1. Peter writes, the elders, pastors, are the word 
presbyteros. He says, to the elders who are among you, I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and also a partaker of the glory that will be revealed. Then he says, shepherd. That's the word we get, pastor. Pastor the flock of God, which is among you, serving as overseers or serving as bishops. So here we have a text that incorporates the three major words for an elder or for a bishop and uses them to speak of the same person. We also see this in Acts chapter 20, verse 17. He writes to the elders in verse 17. Then we see in verse 28, it, it's speaking about the elders of the church there. He says, keep watch over yourselves and all the flock which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. That's the word for bishop. And he says, be shepherds. That's the word for pastors. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he has bought with his own blood. So we have two passages that uses all three of these words in speaking about one position. We learn in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 17, that there may be a distinction between those who are giving themselves on a regular basis in preaching the word and the elders who may be what we call today as lay elders who have positions outside the church or working outside the church. And we may see a distinction there in this text, 1 Timothy 5, 17. It says, let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. So let all the elders, the church has a plurality of elders, honor the elders of the church. Then it goes on to say, especially they who labor in the word and doctrine. That implies that there's going to be a plurality of elders, but among that plurality, there may be a few who are giving their lives their week-to-week -week daily lives in preparing sermons and teaching sermons. And it says, it give them even double honor. So here we see that there are three words speaking about elders, and they all speak of the same position. Now, what are the duties that God has assigned for elders or for bishops or pastors? What are the duties that God has given for them to do? John Owen says the chief duty of a pastor is to feed the sheep. He says he is no pastor who does not feed his flock. If a pastor doesn't teach and preach and in teaching them the word of God, then he's no pastor at all. This is what Acts 6.4 implies. When the apostle says we need, and the leaders of the church of Jerusalem said, we need deacons for this reason so that we can devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministering of the word. He said, we need deacons, not that we can do these other activities, not that we can spend all of our time visiting the sick, all of our time interacting with the people and the needs. He says that we may devote our time to prayer and ministering the word. See, this is the main responsibility. We see this in 2 Timothy 4. Paul charges young Timothy in verse 1, I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. And this is what preaching is. It says, convince, rebuke, exhort, with all long-suffering and teaching. This is the main thing Paul was concerned about for Timothy to carry out in his pastoral ministry. You see, pastors must give themselves to doctrine. They're called to labor in the word. Martin Lloyd-Jones says, the primary task of the church and the Christian minister is the preaching of the word of God. This is primary. John Owen says, the first and principal duty of a pastor is to feed the flock of God by being diligent at preaching the Bible. You see, pastors must study to show themselves approved of God and to be able to rightly interpret and apply the truth. This is in 2 Timothy 2.15. And this is why pastors should be found most often in the study. Richard Baxter says, Of all preaching in the world I hate is the preaching that tends to make the hearers laugh or to move their mind with tickling 
levity. You see, preachers must be serious-minded, and they are called to take this word as messengers of God and rightly divide it and communicate it and apply it to God's people. Just preaching is not all that is required in the ministry. Shepherds must also care for God's sheep. We learn this in the Old Testament in Ezekiel, talking about the shepherds of Israel, how they failed to care for God's people. In chapter 34, in verses 2, it says, Thus says the Lord God, O you shepherds of Israel, who have been feeding yourselves, should not shepherds feed the sheep? You eat the fat, you clothe yourselves with the wool, you slaughter the fat ones, but you do not feed the sheep. The weak you have not strengthened, the sick you have not healed, the injured you have not bound up, the stray you have not brought back, the lost you have not sought, and with force and harshness you have ruled them. So they were scattered because there were no shepherd. And they became food for all the wild beasts. My sheep were scattered. They wandered all over the mountains on every high hill. My sheep were scattered over all the face of the earth with none to search or seek for them. You see, we must take care of the flock. We must know the sheep. If we're going to pasture, we must care and tend to them. We must know those who are weak, those who are strong, those who are struggling, those who need to be encouraged, and those who need to be rebuked. This is what pastoring includes. This is what Peter says in 1 Peter 5, verse 1. The elders who are among you, I shepherd the flock of God, which is among you. You see, lastly, shepherds must rule the sheep or lead the sheep. 1 Timothy 5, 17 says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor. This is what it means to be an elder. It is to take oversight. It's to lead. In fact, Hebrews 13, 7 says, Remember those who have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God, whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. These are the main duties of the pastor. One of the Puritans who understood the importance of the pastoral ministry was Richard Baxter. He was born in 1615, and in 1641 he became the minister of the church that he would pastor for the most of the duration of his life. He was just 26. And they say when he came into this place that there was hardly any Christians at all. In fact, he reports himself that there was only one Christian who would worship God on each street of the city. It says by the time of his ministry has ended, there was hardly one person on each street who did not worship God. He had a huge impact upon the place that he ministered to. And part of the reason why was because he believed that pastoral ministry included not only watching over himself, but watching over the flock and caring for the flock and reaching the lost. In fact, Richard Baxter wrote one of the most important books, at least in my life. In fact, I count it as one of the top five books I've ever read. It's been so impactful. I read it long ago, and I still remember it like it was yesterday. I realized after reading that that my life had to change, and that I could not continue on to be in the ministry unless I took the ministry seriously. And in that book, he says pastors have to watch over two major things. One, he says pastors have to oversee themselves, and two, they have to oversee the flock. Now, he gives us nine reasons why pastors must oversee themselves. He says pastors are depraved like everyone else. Quoting Baxter, he says, God never saved any man for being a preacher, nor because he was an able preacher. No, but because he was justified. Just because someone has spiritual gifts and is able to preach in a very amazing way doesn't mean he's a holy or sanctified or even a justified person second reason pastors should oversee themselves is because they have greater temptations Baxter says take heed to yourselves lest you perish while you call upon others to take heed of perishing unless you famish yourself while you prepare food for others also Baxter says pastors have 
many eyes looking at them. Fourthly, pastor's sins are more scandalous than others. Fifth, he says a great work requires great grace. Sixth, he says the honor of Christ lies more on the pastor than others. Seven, pastors should not expect God's blessing if they are working for their own gain. And that happens in many ministries. Baxter says the ministerial work must be managed purely for God and the salvation of people and not for any private ends of their own. He says, number eight, we should watch over ourselves because we should not expect God's blessing if we're not working with all of our hearts. And ninth, pastors should not expect God's blessing if they are hypocrites. Baxter says, Lord, will you send me with such an unbelieving heart to persuade others to believe? See, this has to be real, meaningful. The pastor must believe what he's calling others to believe. It has to be lived out if he wants others to live out what he's preaching. Baxter understood this, that pastoral ministry begins with the pastor examining his own heart and preaching to his own soul. But pastor's responsibility is not just to watch over their own lives. They have to watch over the flock of God. They have to oversee the sheep that God has placed under them. And he gives eight things that pastors must do as they oversee the flock. One, pastors must know their sheep. Baxter would go to people's homes and talk to them and get to know them. He says pastors need to counsel those who are convicted. They need to have oversight of the families. Fourth, they need to reprove and admonish offenders. Six, they need to labor for conversion. Seven, they need to edify the saints. Eighth, they need to visit the sick. And ninth, they need to exercise church discipline when needed. This is a great book. Every pastor should read this book. But more than that, every pastor should take the ministry seriously. Baxter had a huge impact upon the ministry in his local day. In fact, they say the church started with just a few families. At the time that his ministry is over, is over 600 families. In fact, the book itself, The Reformed Pastor, has been one of the most influential books on this subject. George Whitfield, who visited the community where Baxter preached, said he could still see the great influence of the great pastor, Richard Baxter. Now that's the duties of pastors. But what are deacons? This is another important office in the church. J.I. Packard said of Richard Baxter, Baxter was the most outstanding pastor, evangelist, and writer on practical and devotional themes that Puritans ever produced. Now, what are the duties of the congregation towards their elders? Well, the Bible talks about this as well. One, we should honor our elders. 1 Timothy 5.17, it says, Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor especially those who labor in word and doctrine. We're to obey our elders. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, submit yourselves to your elders. Hebrews 13.17, obey those who rule over you and be submissive for they watch out for your souls. As those who must give an account, let them do so with joy and not with grief, for that would be unprofitable for you. Thirdly, we're called to financially support them. 1 Timothy 5, verse 17. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor. We've read that a couple times now. But this is why we should honor them and how we should honor them, not just with our lips, but also with our financial help. It goes on to say, For the scripture says, You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. God has designed for those who labor in the word to live by the word. Galatians 6.6 6 says, Let him who has taught the word share in all good things with him who teaches. So if we're sitting under someone's ministry and profiting from that ministry, we have an obligation to God to support that minister. And fourthly, we're called not to be quick to accuse them. 
1 Timothy 5, 19. Do not receive an accusation against an elder except from two or three witnesses. See, we have responsibilities to honor our elders, to obey our elders, to support our elders, and not be quick to accuse them. Now, that's the first major office of the church, the office of eldership. Now, there's a second office in the church. This office is the office of deacons. This is also a plurality of servants. Now, what is the responsibility of deacons? We see that they're not given here to rule over the church or to oversee the church. We see by the very name deacons that they're called to be servants. See, this is evident by the very Greek word diakonos, which literally means a runner who kicks up dust behind him. Someone who's going around serving, busying himself, waiting on tables or waiting on the needs that he sees. Someone who's a runner or a servant is the idea behind the word. The word is used as ministers. 2 Corinthians 3, 6. Who has made us sufficient to be ministers? That's the very word for deacon. Matthew 20, 28. Jesus used the word deacon in this way. Whoever will be great among you, you must be your servant, the Akinos. So this is what the deacon is. He's a servant. And the main responsibility to serve the church is to help guard the eldership from a lot of busy work. Sadly, sometimes elders are so busy serving the people, they have no time to study, no time to prepare, no time to pray. And so God has designed the deacons to be a buffer to protect the time of the eldership. We see that in Acts chapter 6. Verse 2, it is not right that we should give up preaching the word of God to serve tables. Therefore, brothers, pick out from among you seven men of good report, full of the spirit and of wisdom, whom we will appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the ministry of the word. So, one of the principal responsibilities of deacons is to make sure the elders are free to do their jobs. Now, that might sound like an insignificant role, but that's a very important role. But the deacon is not just to help the elders. It's to serve the people. It's to wait on tables. It's to make sure the needs of the people, those who are sick, those who are struggling, have someone to go visit them and help them. In fact, if a servant doesn't have a law for people, then he should not be a deacon at all. Thus, deacons are to help oversee practical ministries. Deacons are not janitors. It's a misconception to think that deacons are just to go about making coffee, opening the church doors, and doing work of that nature. Every church member can take out the trash. Deacons have an important role. They have a very important role to care for the needs of the people to oversee maybe the benevolence fund. The real needs of the church, the deacons are there. They're, the, they're kind of like the first responders. They oversee the ministration of the church. That way the elders can be free to do what they're called to do. In fact, deacons are to work side by side with the elders. Now, the Bible says these offices have certain qualifications. Not anyone can take these offices on themselves. It is God who raises these men up for these positions. But we learn in 1 Timothy 3 that there are certain qualities and qualifications that are necessary to fill these offices. Paul says if a man desires the office of a bishop, he desires a good work. A bishop then must be blameless, the husband of one wife, diligent, sober, of good behavior, given to hospitality, apt to teach, not given to wine, not a striker, not greedy, a filthy lucre, but patient, not a brawler, not covetous, and one that rules his own house well. One of the things that we notice in here about the qualification of elders that we don't see in the qualification of deacons, in fact, there's simply the same qualifications except one. The difference is that an elder is called to teach, and thus he must have the gift of teaching. He must be apt to teach. Thus we have a responsibility before we lay our hands on anyone unto this great work to make sure 
they have these qualifications described here in the Bible. So here we see there are two major offices to the church. And both of these offices include a plurality of men, a plurality of elders who have certain responsibilities outlined in the scriptures. And we have a plurality of deacons that have certain responsibilities that are also outlined in the scriptures. We're not free to create new offices. We're not free to divide elders between a bishop and pastors. We're responsible if we want the church to be in submission to its ultimate head, Jesus Christ, we're responsible to look into the Word of God and take what we're doing as a church body and submit itself to the Word of God. Ultimately, Christ is the head of the church. Ultimately, the Word of God controls its functions, its leadership. And it's our job as a member of Christ's body to submit ourselves to his word and submit ourselves to his church. All right. Craig, can you get those lights for me again, please, buddy? Thanks. All right, so that was a little longer, I think a couple minutes longer than the other ones, but we've got 710, so we got a lot of information, but uh, we'll get through what we get through, you know, a lot of, a lot of stuff in there, but I think, uh, you know, most of you in this room uh, attend or members or regular attenders at church here, but uh, you've probably heard this idea of, you know, the structure of, uh, of the church that uh, we believe the scriptures say there's two offices. And, and so uh, there are other churches, uh, certainly uh, Roman Catholicism or Episcopalian that have different type of governance structures. There's even, you know, even Protestant uh, denominations that would have different structures uh, than, than that. But, you know, as we go through some of this, <clears throat> can certainly look through. We probably won't unpack, we'll have time to unpack all this stuff. But if you actually, if you have your book, uh, what page is that? 69. Page 69 in the book gives a great uh, list of the qualifications for elders and deacons, and it has them like side by side there, so you can see them well and uh, and see what those qualifications are that, that the Lord gives. And then obviously, you know, there there's be a recognition of of uh, of those things there, and then also recognition of giftedness um, if it's going to be a, a pastor uh, for teaching, you know, and preaching and those types of things. But as we start. You know, uh, we're kind of unpacking really what is the function of the church or, or how, how does the church function? You know, we've talked about the marks, we've talked about the mission, the goals, membership, uh, the significance of membership, um, why we're to be members, uh, the power of, of the church, the authority of the church in the life of a believer and a life of the body of believers. But uh, in order for it to, to work, you know, we're talking tonight about polity, right? We're talking about structure, we're talking about church governance. Um, uh, Philippians 1.1, 1, 1, uh, he alluded to in there, uh, points out that it should be a plurality. Uh, and, and so do many other scriptures in the New Testament, that there should be a plurality of elders and deacons. And so certainly we can get caught up in the weeds, you know, of questions like, well, uh, what about a church that doesn't have a plurality? We don't have a plurality of, of deacons right, this, right now. We did until about a year ago. Um, and so... Is it always going to be that it's going to be that's going to be the case? No, it's not. But it's ideal that you do have a multiplicity there and a plurality there. So, uh, thankfully, right now we do have two elders and a deacon, so we do have a plurality certainly in our leadership. Uh, but again, we're not going to just talk about us specifically. But I just want to kind of head those questions off if we have them, because uh, some of you might be thinking, "Well, we only have one deacon," you know, and so. Uh, just know that we would love to have more deacons. We would love to have more pastors. Uh, so if the Lord chooses to provide those for us, we are open and, and ready. <laughs> we are game for that. And so, um, you know, but the structure is there. Why do you think, what do you think about with that? Why do you think it's important 
uh, to have a plurality of, of elders, <coughs> plurality of leadership. What do you think about that? Or is it important? Because it there, can become a dictatorship, you know. Mm. You know, you have to have, you know, at least two in the leadership, <coughs> so there isn't no one person running the whole show. Okay. But it also takes the weight off of, and the burden off of just one. So Good. It, it, you know, <coughs> yeah, at least it should, right? Spreads it out so it's yeah. not just completely on one person. Correct. Uh, yeah, because it's, it's a lot, you know. Um, been doing it for a while, and I can tell you, yeah, it's, it's a lot. Uh, you know, Brian and Steve and I would all tell you, it's it just, just having a, a church of about 50 or so here, having the three of us, it's a lot. There's no way I can possibly understand how a church can have 100 or 150 and have one pastor. I, I just I don't understand how that works. I'm just going to leave that there and leave it at that. Uh, but it, because it's difficult, to your point, you know, there's no one helping. You know, there's no one really helping mm-hmm. carry the burden. And there'll be people that help, don't get me wrong, just like all of you help in your capacities, but it's different uh, being a pastor. You know, being a, a co-pastor and ha- helping to carry the weight of pastoring is different than helping out in, in other ways. And so it's all significant. But uh, certainly, I, I think protection, you guys have hit the, hit the nail on the head with these things. <clears throat> Um, so the scripture does give three words. He didn't give the Greek words. Uh, I give them because we've done studies about this before, but just as a reminder and for note takers, if you want to write those down, actually that's a typo. I messed up and put the wrong line in. Those are the right words. Uh, you got presbyteros, you got episkopos, and you got poimino. Um, presbyteros is actually, uh, presbyteros is actually elder. Bishop should be with overseer, actually. So uh, presbyteros means elder, episkopos is a bishop or an overseer, and poimano is a shepherd. And that's where we actually, we derive the word pastor from poimano, from shepherd, because pastoring is, is shepherding in a sense, and that's where they get that, that word. Where, where does the word, because I don't know, uh, under shepherd, where does that come from? Just the idea that uh, Jesus is the good shepherd. Right, he says okay, in John sorry. 10, I am the good shepherd. So, you know, all pastors, then we kind of consider all pastors under shepherds. Gotcha. Because is under shepherd in the Bible or just, just a shepherd? No, not really. It's okay, just so kind of a, an idea, yeah, right, right? An idea of, you know, right, we are the shepherds here, but we're not the shepherd. Right. right, right. right. It's kind of trying to humble yourself, okay, you know. Giving the glory yeah. of Christ, yeah. basically. So, um, so those are the words there, uh, because again, in the, there's three words in the Greek. In your Bible, uh, you'll have different words there in the translation. You have all those words: bishop, elder, overseer, pastor. Right, that's four right there. Um, all those words. Uh, again, the key is in that they all refer to one office. Uh, we're not talking about there's one office of bishop, there's one that's an overseer, and there's one that's a pastor or an elder, uh, and that's where a lot of churches kind of mix it up. Uh, like he's saying, and how they separated them. And, and with Ignatius, he was talking more of, Ignatius kind of got more of the Catholic thing, yeah. where you have a bishop, meaning yeah. like he's over many pastors. Uh, the Episcopal Church does that. that. You know, there's other churches that do that as well, that have a hierarchy, uh, you know, of, of pastors, and then above them is bishops and, and so on like that. Uh, some pastors, or some churches kind of get it in, in more of the recent model would be, you know where they'll say they have a, a church has a board of elders, to where these men are are kind of overseeing the pastor. So they have a pastor, but then they have a board of elders who kind of are supposed to oversee the pastor and protect the church. You know, some way like that. But again, that's not biblical. Uh, it's just if an elder is a pastor, um, you know, a pastor is an elder. These are all interchangeable, and I don't want you to take my word for that. Uh, look over at 1 Peter chapter 5, and uh, let's get into a little bit of scriptures here um, real quick. Um, so if that makes sense, anybody been to a church like that or you understand what I'm saying where they'll they'll differentiate to say, uh, and I'll have that discussion, it can get confusing because I've had this discussion with pastors, and you know, to talk about their church or something, and they're like, oh yeah, you know, I'm the pastor, you know, but we've got three other elders and then in, in our dialogue, going back and forth, you, I find they don't mean co-elders. Like, he's the pastor, and then they have these other ones who are elders, and that they're different, and they have different roles and things. And so um, that's not biblical. Doesn't mean to say there aren't different 
there's not going to be different roles in the plurality of elders, and we'll get to that in a moment too. Sounds like shareholders of a company, you know that. Well, that's or see a CEO. Yeah, you know? it does, doesn't it? Well, yeah, that sounds like happened. the business. Yeah, yeah, it has happened. That's what happened. Is it's become this corporate model, mm -hmm. and because and you can understand, look, as the church grows and gets bigger, you have to have structure. Mm -hmm. You you got to yeah, figure out a structure. But like I said, it's hard enough just with 50 of us yeah. here. If it's a church of 500 or 5,000. I mean, you 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 got to have organization. You, you got to have structure. So there will be different roles, uh, you know, to where, um, you know, even looking again at it, the three of us, you know, Brian and I kind of carry the, the majority of the preaching and teaching with me obviously being the majority of that uh, as kind of, and we would call, I'm, I would, my title is the lead pastor. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm above the other two. You know what I mean? Like we all three have equal vote and equal say on all things. I just am called the lead pastor because I'm the full-time paid pastor and I do the majority of the preaching and the teaching. Uh, but uh, the others do, but Steve Steve doesn't do preaching and teaching typically. He does on Tuesdays. He does his um, sermon and preparation and, and talks and stuff on Tuesdays, but that's just because it's an agreement between the three of us to do what Jason said, to share the load and what does that look like. And so, you know, we're doing that together to, to help do it as best as, as we possibly can. Uh, but in this, in this, these verses, this is um, important. Who's, who's got it? Maybe can read those first three verses for us. First Peter 5, 1 to 3. Anybody there? I'll read. Okay. We'll look, go ahead. We'll look build. <clears throat> Joe always gets the reading fun. For <laughs> blessing. Yep. Okay. The elders which are among you, I exhort who am also a elder, a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. <coughs> Feed the flock of God, which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint or willingly, not for filthy, filthy liker, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples of the flock, yeah. And when the shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory. That's good. That's Thank you. Thought away. Yeah. Um, and there you go with the chief shepherd again. See it? The chief shepherd. And so, um, you know, that's a, he heard me say amen. That's hilarious. Yeah. She's, she's getting ready to go. Like, no, that was, I tricked her. Um, so, but in this, the key that I'm looking at is, uh, you know, if you look at the fourth or fifth word in there, and you're, depending on your translation, it says elders. Um, that word there is presbyteros, okay? Uh, when you skip forward down a little bit, you get to verse 2. I think Bill said feed the flock. Uh, that word can also be translated perhaps in your Bible as shepherd the flock. And that word is poimino. Uh, when you go down to the end of verse, a little bit farther than that, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight. That's the word episkopos. You have all three words used here in this one text interchangeably uh talking about the the same uh the same office uh acts 2028 20, he, he talked about um but i do want to show you one other one titus so let's go to titus one and uh and, and look at that and in titus chapter three you can find those qualifications of deacons and elders as well um, but titus chapter one if i can get there verses five to nine Whoever gets there wants to read that for us. Five through nine? Yep, thank you. Qualifications of elders. <clears throat> for this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you, namely, if any man is above reproach, the husband of one wife, having children who believe, not accused of dissipation or rebellion. Four, the overseer must, uh, must be above approach as God's steward, not self-willed, not quick-tempered, not addicted to wine, not pugn pugnacious, not found of sordid game, but hospitable, hospitable, mm -hmm. loving, what is good, sensible, just, 
devote self control okay. yep. holding fast the faithful word which is in accordance with the teaching so that he will be able both to exhort in sound doctrine and to re and to refute those who con contradict good thank you yeah so uh, I said Titus 3 I meant first Timothy 3 Titus 1 here is where we get the uh, qualifications for elders. You also find it in 1 Timothy chapter 3. Um, and some of those, uh, this one is important to me, uh, verse 9, as you ended there, you know, it says that they must be able to, to teach, um, be trustworthy with the word, and it says to give uh, instruction on sound doctrine and, circle underlined in my Bible, and to be able to rebuke those who contradict it. Um, so you've got to be, you know, mature in the word, and one of those things is being able to defend the truth against people who are not speaking the truth. Um, and, and again, I would say to you, that's applicable for all of us. That's not just for elders. Uh, this is something that we should be putting into play. But uh, I take us here to say, you see the word elders um, in, in there, appoint elders in every town. <clears throat> so that's our word, uh, presbyteros. Then you have verse 7, for an overseer, and that's the episkopos. So you have these two words used right here in a couple of verses, interchangeable for the same thing. It's, he says, an elder must do this and this and this, for an overseer must do this and this and this. He's using them as the same thing. Uh, and so, you know, to separate offices like that uh, simply isn't, isn't scriptural. Uh, and so we see two offices, you know, not three, not four, uh, and not, not more, certainly. But uh, so those three words, uh, you know, are, are distinct, and they, and they show us the roles here, uh, that there is one role for, for the one who rules. And as we look at that, uh, again, there may be a distinction uh, between, um, because go, we're in Titus, go over to First Timothy, flip to the left a little bit, and we'll get to First Timothy chapter 5. He was in First Timothy a lot, chapter 5, chapter 3. Yeah. Um, look at First Timothy 5 and verse 17. He used this one, and, and look at what it says here. It says, let the elders who rule well be considered, so the elders rule, okay, right? right? So the elders who rule uh, well consider worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in preaching and teaching. So, uh, we, we may see a distinction here between the elders who are ruling and elders who are ruling and teaching. See it? There, there may, because it says especially the rulers who are teaching. So there may be a distinction here within the office itself to say there will be those who are elders in the local church who might not do the preaching and teaching. See what I'm saying? So it doesn't mean that because we have 18 elders, whatever, call it a big church. Uh, look, uh, most of us are familiar with, with Grace Community Church, John MacArthur, uh, or, or Alistair Begg, or uh, churches like that where they have, one of them I know has like 31 elders. And, you know, I think it's MacArthur, and who said, you know, I've got 31 elders or whatever. Uh, when it comes down to it, like my voice is one voice and one vote among 31. But who is it that's known for Grace Church? Who is it that does the preaching and teaching at Grace Church? It's the one man. There, there are some of them, other ones teach Sunday schools and do teach and do those things. But it's not going to be that you're going to have a revolving door of, you know, hey, you're up today and you're up today and I'll be up in 31 weeks. You know, we're rotating all that. So it doesn't mean, again, that there aren't going to be maybe tweaks and nuances to the responsibilities that each man has. But in that what should we get from all this? I'm saying that, but it should still come full circle to say, do every one of those elders need to meet the qualifications? Yeah. Yeah. They do. And one of them is preaching and teaching. Yeah. So, uh, so that's, you know, kind of a, kind of a big point there. Well, I only thing what's important too is the, the leadership there. When you have one pastor at the very top, a board is one thing, but not having equal votes, I think can get, because um, well, you, can no. become, you can get like you know five yeses no. under no. that person and it can still be 
No. Sure. And that can still happen, it, right? It can, but right. I mean, no. um, I just think it's... That's well, that's why you got to have the plurality. Yeah. And ideally, uh, ideally, plurality, an odd plurality. Uh, we've said that since, you know, it was Jonathan was here, and then when I came, it was me and Jonathan. Uh, then, then Brian came, and we loved that because there was three of us. Yeah. Then when right. Jonathan left... Um, you know, we were talking about Steve before Jonathan even left. But then when Jonathan left, you know, we, we brought Steve on. Because you see, see, what would be the benefit of having an odd number? Break the tie. Mm -hmm. Right? Uh, so, yeah, because now, right now, if Steve and I are on differing sides, what do you do? You know what I mean? And right now, we would say we would talk to Greg and get his insight. But he's not an elder. You know, uh, can he say something to persuade me or Steve to budge and go the other direction? You know what I mean? Like, who knows? Lord willing, nothing comes up that's going to happen like that. But ideally, because uh, like you're saying, anything can happen with that. Uh, and you're going to have, if you had 30 elders, you're going to have men who you're closer personal friends with than others, right? Because that's just how people are. Uh, but Lord willing, if they're an elder, they should be above reproach. They should be seeking to do the things that they believe are godly and not just to say, like, hey, Jason, I like you better than I like James, so I'm going to side with you. Like, if that's happening, like, we got a problem already, right? <laughs> yeah. But that's why you need the plurality because it's not, it's not a corporate system to where we bring in a, a board of elders, and, and that's been like that at a church that I've been a part of, to where it's like, oh, we have elders. But when you look at the elders, the elders are a committee of a board of kind of, like, different people to kind of bring in to kind of be a corporate structure just to kind of say because they have one pastor it's just to kind of say no we do have that but it's not really structured right and that can happen a lot i was just going to say i think it's interesting because i know in the past we've always talked about how uh you know somebody who's preaching and teaching um you know there's multiple multiple verses that point to you know the double judgment upon yourself you know I think it's 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 cool that now we're seeing well there's double honor with that too. Right. Mm -hmm. you know, or there but, should be. Well no, right. I mean but it I mean, it says yeah. scripturally yeah. that there's Correct. a double honor for that person, right? Well, it's but, saying but that's there, talking to the congregation, saying that you should be giving the double honor to your elder, which right. you will give. Right. Right. That's, right. That's what I'm saying. But right. Yeah. Very rarely do you hear the double honor. Yeah. It's always Correct. double judgment. Mm -hmm. Correct. So it's it's good to to see that as well. Good. Yeah, because you're right, and uh, you know, and I think if we have time, we may not. So we'll just kind of talk, which is great. That's what we want is more dialogue. Um, but because that's kind of later in the later in my notes, you know, we talked about that later on about here's the account of, here's the accountability, like you're saying, because that comes on the for elders. Here's the qualifications. Here's the giftedness, and then it's the James three one that you're talking about. Not many of you should be teachers because you know you'll be held with a higher accountability, higher judgment. So there's always that talk because uh, he says those who desire to be a bishop or an elder desire a good thing. Like if God's put that on your heart to want to do that, that's great. But we just got to check all these other things and to remember that you're going to be held to a stricter judgment, you know, and all those things. So it's kind of a weighty thing to, to make it, like, difficult for you to wrestle through. Um, but then on the other side is, like, what you're pointing to is the other side of the coin of <clears throat> what is the congregation's responsibilities to the pastor? Uh, and that's where that would come in, you know, that, that you are to hold them in high esteem as your overseers and it's saying especially the ones who rule well deserve the double honor like you're saying especially the ones who preach and teach so you could certainly say double your honor of your respect yes but also in the of taking care of them financially and all the things that would entail all of that um is, is a good point to say that's kind of the two sides of the coin you know what is the elder down if you will what is the elder to the congregation and what is the congregation to the, the elder because there's instruction for you know, for us in this room in this church, there's instructions in there for me, and there's instructions in here for you, uh, you know, and for, for us to de together to, to try that to strive to do that. Of, um, Ephesians about the, the wife and the husband, where it yes. sounds so good for the yeah. husband at first, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like, but here's, here's, the, here's the standard. It's like, oh, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true, um, because it's but difficult. There's two sides, yeah. Um, we've got to skip through this. We already talked about that. Maybe these for, for note takers if you don't have your book. Um, I have a question. Yeah. Just seg not really 
this exact topic, but the gentleman on the video was talking about Jack or John Owen. Uh, I've never heard of that guy. What's he? Yeah, John Owen. John Owen. Um, which, Who is he? And, uh, I have a quote coming up for him in a minute, but we have talked about him a little bit in our in the past. Uh, he's a Puritan, and uh, actually I actually have a bookmark with with his name and face on it. I think I can show you. But um, he was a, a Puritan pastor, a uh, Puritan writer. Uh, yeah, just a great theologian uh, of the Puritan time, which remembers the like six like sixteen to eighteen hundreds. Um, sixteen would end, you know, sixteen eighteen hundreds like that two hundred year period. Uh, Richard Baxter, who he's talking about, John uh, John Bunyan. Um, there's lots of them, obviously, um, but yeah, he's a well well known one, a really really strong theologian. Um, I got a quote coming up for him from him here in a second. Um, so three duties. There's duties of the office of elder, and uh, I'll go through these quickly so we can get on Greg also. <laughs> so we're not spending all our time on the on the pastor. I can get on Greg here a little bit. Uh, I tease, but um, you know, duties of the elder, uh, preaching. And that would be the primary, as you guys know. I, we believe here that the, the church, you know, the heart of, of worship and the heart of, of the church, uh, of the local church, should be the preaching and teaching of God's Word. Everything else should stem from that. Uh, so all the other things are good, uh, if they're good things, but everything comes from preaching and teaching the Word of God. The Word of God is what saves people. The Word of God is what changes people. It's what sanctifies people. It is our instruction. It is the only pure truth and righteous thing we have not me not you <laughs> you know what i mean like this is this is this is the thing and so it, it needs to be the main thing and so whoever the pastors or elders are of the church i in my opinion they need to have that frame of mind and in my opinion far too few churches have that opinion and that's the problem for me with most churches is that they don't have that as the view of what is you know going to be the, the main the main thing um, but we're not here to, to get on that. Primary responsibility, we get that from Acts 6, where they select the seven deacons. Uh, and we, he read that in, in there in the, in the video, you know, that the deacons were selected to try to help serve all the people that were coming to them so that they could be freed, the, the apostles at that time, uh, to do the, the ministering of the word, meaning the preaching and teaching of the word, and prayer. And so those would be kind of primary things there. Excuse me, you can write those down, 2 Timothy 4, 1 to 2. We'll have time to look at all these because um, I want to give a couple good quotes here. Martin Lloyd-Jones, who you all heard from me many times, love him too. Uh, I would say even Jay, he's probably the last. Many people would refer to Lloyd-Jones as the, the last of the Puritans. I think he was born in 1899. Uh, if I'm, I might be right in thinking he lived till he died in 1981. But I think pretty sure he was born in 1899. So technically, he makes it because the Puritans are thought of from the 16 to the 1800s. And so Martin Lloyd was, was born in 1899, so people <laughs> count him. Uh, but he says the primary task of the church and of the Christian minister is the preaching of the Word of God. Uh, and so I would, I would concur. Uh, John Owen, here's your guy, says the first and principal duty of a pastor is to feed the flock of God by diligently preaching the Word of God. So uh, shepherding the flock is feeding the flock, caring for the flock. And how you gr best do that as a pastor is by ministering to them the word of God. I just want to tell you Martin Lloyd Jones' birthday is December 20th. He barely made it, but he's in there. There you go. 1899, right? Yes. To 1981? Yeah, by yeah. 11 days. <laughs> God knew what he was doing. <laughs> Uh, second, uh, shepherding. Yeah, so feeding, shepherding, caring for the flock of God. Uh, we looked at First Peter 5 already to see that. Ezekiel 34 is the scripture that he pulled from in the Old Testament uh, that you can write that down also and look at, uh, talking about how they were not shepherding well and that they weren't doing good things. Remember, Jesus even harped on the, lead, the religious leaders in his time when he was there, saying that, remember, he, he said... Uh, uh, he had compassion upon the people because he looked out and saw them as sheep with no shepherd uh, because the shepherds were starving the sheep and, and, and not caring for the sheep. Um, you know, sh here you go, serving, preaching, counseling. I just list listed a bunch of things. Living an exemplary life for others to follow. Uh, that's a key too uh, because in 1 Timothy 4, I think it is, uh, Paul tells Timothy there, or maybe it's 2 Timothy 4, uh, Paul's last letter is pretty much his dying words. He says to Timothy, you know, preach in season and out of season. Always be ready. Uh, and he says, and be mindful or be careful of your doctrine and your life. 
you know, saying like, teach the truth and live it out because you're supposed to do that uh, for those who you are shepherding. Third thing is ruling, uh, and that's the three. So you got preaching, um, shepherding, and uh, ruling. And so overseeing, uh, leading, and, and again, we see that in 1 Timothy 5, uh, Hebrews 13, 7. I'm gonna, you can go to Hebrews 13 because there's, I know we're going to hit another verse in there in a minute too. Uh, Hebrews 13, 7. It says, Remember your leaders, those who spoke to you the word of God. Consider the outcome of the way of life and imitate their faith. So there's the idea there again of uh, how is it that you're to rule uh, well, people, there's a saying, right, to, to lead by example. Um, Christ-like leadership, we'd, we would call servant leadership, uh, but certainly, you know, he led by example and he led by serving, right? Good. Uh, Richard Baxter, that's the book he was referring to. It's called The Reformed Pastor, and uh, just emphasis there on, uh, again, overseeing yourself uh, and overseeing the flock uh, because, Remember, uh, that's why I kind of always use the word under shepherd, because uh, pastors also are sheep. You with me? We're, pastors are just men. Elders are just men. They, too, are sheep uh, of, of the flock uh, who are, 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 you know, brought into this fold by the chief shepherd. Okay, so, uh, so we've got to watch ourselves and, you know, preach the gospel to ourselves, hold ourselves accountable, rebuke ourselves, exhort ourselves, you know, in, in the, the way of humility, obviously, but to do it um, so that we can do it with others. Here was the other side of that coin uh, that we were kind of talking about a minute ago, Jason. Um, just, you know, duties or responsibilities of the congregation then to the elders and, uh, you know, to honor them, to obey them. Uh, go ahead and I would say write these down, and, and we only got 20 minutes. Write them down and, and look at them. Uh, some of the stuff is in the, in the book in your chapter 5, so uh, if you don't have the study guide or aren't using it, it's very helpful. All this stuff is in there, and it's, it's great just to read through that, and you can go read the scriptures and, and look to it and study it for yourself. Um, yeah, this study is very scripturally based. It's very solid. Um, so as you read through it and look at it, <clears throat> it's, it's really good. So read through those scriptures uh, about honor uh, obeying them, we're in Hebrews 13. Uh, so look at verse 17. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who will have to give an account. So Jason, going back to your double judgment accountability, do you see, do you see how this verse here might warn you about considering the eldership? It's saying, I have to give an account for those that God has given me charge over. So, that means I'm going to give account for everything that I do or don't do in regards of shepherding the flock here. Uh, so that is uh, can be a, a very weary and, and burdensome thing. And it says, let them do this. Now, here's the other side. For me, I'm going to give an account. And so to you, it says, obey and submit to those leaders, knowing they're going to give an account. And it says, let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that will be no advantage of, to you, right? So don't be the kid who's kicking and whining and screaming and, and gossiping and talking behind the back and doing all these things against your pastor, uh, because that is not going to be to your benefit, right? How, how do you feel when, uh, you know, your, your kid's giving you a hard time and, and just you know, you're, you're not getting along very well, uh, your relationship isn't where you want it to be, right? That's not how you want to be. You don't want to be a thorn in the side of, of your pastor, and your pastor doesn't want you to be a thorn in their side and doesn't want to be, you know, uh, a thorn in your side either, right? Good. Last couple. Financially support them. We talked a lot about that, I think, a couple of sessions ago. Uh, too, with the, uh, with the responsibilities of church and membership and things. Um, but some good verses he quoted there in Galatians <coughs> 6, 6, uh, let everyone who's taught the word of God share every, all things with the one who taught him. Uh, 1 Corinthians 9 is a really good passage to go to uh, for, uh, for this. And uh, actually go there. Let's look at that one. And then uh, we'll pass here the torch over to talk about deacons a little bit. <coughs> 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 9. 
Who else wants to read for us tonight? Do I say these things on human authority? Does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Is it for the oxen that God is concerned? Does he not certainly speak for our sake? It was written for our sake, because the, the plowman should plow in hope, and the thresher should thresh, and the thresher thresh in hope of sharing in the crop. If we have sown spiritual things, among you is it too much if we reap material things from you? If others share this rightful claim on you, do we do not reap even more? Excuse me. Nevertheless, we have not made us of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. Do you, you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings? In the same way, the Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. Okay, so there you go. <clears throat> not going to preach and expound on that too much pretty much sums it up clearly there, right? He's not talking about muzzling an ox, uh, you know, from, from the work. He's saying, does God really care about that? He's, he's making the point that you're not supposed to make it laborious on your, on your leaders, on your, you know, kind of tying into the last verse we looked at. Um, but that, uh, you know, that they have a right. He was saying, Paul was saying this, remember I was an apostle, saying to the Church of Corinth, carnal, sinful church, immature church, he's saying, look, we didn't take this right. We have the right, and we didn't do it. And he says, because we didn't want to be a stumbling block to the gospel, saying you are so immature that you can't even handle if we would take what is rightfully ours. You can't even understand that I'm telling you this because you're going to get upset because you're so immature and can't even handle uh, what's happening. But the point is that you are to that, that we are entitled to this, that you should be helping. And he goes on later another place to say, you know, we've been robbing from other churches in order to come serve you saying, like, you're so immature and you so don't know what you're doing that the mature church is actually paying us and helping us to come and minister to you. Uh, and so kind of egg on your face, shame on you, and you need to wake up and understand and sanctify, right, and get sanctified. So uh, all that just to say those who make a living on the gospel, he's saying, should make their living by the gospel. And obviously that's if possible. There's going to be all kinds of scenarios right under the under the under the sun that we all understand that if there's a church who can't afford to to pay a pastor, if they're a small church, if they're a poor church in, you know, third world country, there's all kinds of scenarios that these are like the ideal, you know, scenarios, even the same with eldership. Secret churches in China that are small and they don't have someone that can be a pastor. You know what I mean? Like what do we do with those? And we don't need to take I think now all those rabbit trails to go to the end. This is just to say, this is biblically how the leadership of the church is to be structured. So, Lord willing, if God wants that church to continue to exist and to grow, then what do you think God can do to do that? I think he'd be a pretty good shepherd. <laughs> think, think he could provide, right, for someone to, to do that. Well, also, I mean, <coughs> if a person... If, if a pastor is a, truly a laborer of the gospel, you know, this person has given up a lot of his life to, you know, to, uh, to feed the flock. You know, it's just like back in the old days when, you know, he was a, hey, bring your first, bring your, bring your first fruits so there's sure. always food in my house. Yeah. So it's also, you know, it, it can be a one-way, well, you're the pastor, you figure it out, we're going to go out and eat, and we'll bring you back whatever, you know, it has to be, the pastor has to feel some type of uh, satisfaction that God is actually providing for them. You know, it can't be, because we're, we're human, so, you know. Sure. It'll, it'll, yeah. it'll take a toll on you, so I'm trying to say, if you don't, people don't respect and sure. help. You yeah, and again, it's a two-way street, yeah. two-sided coin in all of this, right? There's responsibilities for the elders. There's responsibilities for the congregation. There's accountability for the elders. There's accountability for the congregation. Uh, like Jill said, good picture with the husband-wife. You know, yeah. different roles, different accountability, different responsibility, uh, but yet God has made it. That's how the relationship is to work, is how he's told us that it's supposed yeah. to work. So meeting ain't that bad until you hear what the... With the husband passing through. <laughs>
Well, let's go on to uh, second office, right? Second office of the church is that of deacon. Um, deacon comes from the word uh, diakonos, uh, is the Greek word there, and there's uh, diakonos and doulos. Those are the two words in the Greek that you'll find in your Bible translated as servant or slave. Uh, there is a significant difference, which is why I bring it up. Uh, some translations use servant for both those words, which I think is a misinterpretation or mistranslation, I should say, uh, because the word doulos refers to a slave, a, a sl- and that's what we're called to be doulos for Christ, uh, that we were slaves, doulosses, to sin, and we are now do loss slave to Christ. That we've never been free, you'll never be free, you're always a slave. You were slave to sin or you're slave to Christ and righteousness. And slave means, uh, what's the difference between a slave and a servant? A slave is owned. You're by owned somebody, somebody else. By somebody else. Good. A servant, you serve. You're slave is owned, owned by someone else, has no rights of their own. Yeah. Is under the authority directly of someone else mm-hmm. in everything. Uh, a servant is different right? They have their own abilities and freedom, and they could have been servants in a house kind of like a slave, but they're a servant, and they still have rights and things that slaves don't have. Uh, so again, the, the word here just means that servant. It means serving. Uh, Matthew 20, Jesus talks about that uh, in regards to himself, right? He says, uh, the son of man uh, came not to be served, but to, to serve others and to be the ransom uh, for many. And so Uh, That's what we're talking about. And so as we um, think of the office of deacon, uh, we've got some duties and responsibilities. Again, three here uh, for the deacon. Greg, I hope you're taking notes. (laughs) We can't see his face on the screen anymore. (laughs) And, uh, yeah, he's like, hey, three, three would be good. (laughs) But um, uh, I tease, but um, uh, we've got guard the, and I don't even know. I can see you guys. Are you all, can you guys still hear us? What's weird is when we switch from the video to the slides. We hear you. Perfect. Okay, cool. Because when we switch from the video to the slides, y'all's faces are no longer on the TV, so we can't see you. Um, so I just want to oh, make okay. I want to make sure we could hear you if you want to uh, chime in, and, and certainly Greg and Pam also, whoever. Uh, so just so we know you're still there. Um, I can see little pictures on my uh, computer, but it's too far away. I can't really see. Uh, so the first one is guard the eldership. Uh, that he talked about, and, you know, just assisting the elders, meaning guarding them from having to do too much of the, you know, getting in the weeds stuff, the too much of, there's always stuff. Uh, The stairs need to be pressure washed. The trash needs to go out. Uh, This needs to be cleaned up. That needs to be done. The toilet needs to be fixed, right? You guys know this. You've been around the church for a long time. Uh, And as he said, anyone could do that. Thank you for fixing the toilets. Thank you for taking the trash out. Uh, thank you for mopping the floors. Like, that's not, uh, a lot of churches have the mentality, a lot of churches have the mentality of like, you know, the pastor is the one we're paying. Like, the pastor is the guy. Like, he does, that's, he can do that. Like, you fix the toilet. You take the trash out. You do this. You do that. And don't take, you know, don't take my opinion for it because I'm the pastor and I want to put work off of myself. What does the Bible says is the, is the job uh, description of the pastor? Teach and pray. That sums it up. Teach and preach and pray. Um, And so certainly there's many other things, shepherding and caring. There's all those things that are encompassed in it. But uh, it doesn't mean I don't take the trash out or I don't mop the floor. We can't do those things, right? But understand it's it's, um, to guard the elders. the, The deacon is to help guard the elder from those things. And so it makes sense that you would want to have a plurality of of deacons, uh, because if we had more than than one Greg, uh, one Greg helps helps us out crazy greatly. Uh, if I had three or four Gregs, I could probably do seven or eight Bible studies a week, <laughs> because uh, you know there's just other things that you have to do. Um, so Acts six two we've already talked about talks about that a little bit. Um, you got to serve the congregation again. Serve that's the key here. Serving. Um, loving other people, visiting the sick, uh, taking soup to people when they're sick. Uh, and, and again, are these are these things only things that the deacons should do? Any disciple should be able to do that. We all can do that. Yeah. And I've 
I've had that love for many of you here, and, and I know of others who have done that. You know, take soup to this person when they're sick, or you know, go visit to see how this person's doing. Uh, these are things that, you know, we're all supposed to have in our tool belt, right? Um, but when you talk about the structure of the church and the offices of the church, these are just part of kind of the job description, again, if you will, that comes along with being a deacon. But also is that list in there of qualifications, you know, uh, being reverent, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy, pure conscience, uh, tested above reproach, blameless, uh, faithful wife, exemplarily in, in leading their family. You know, essentially, essentially the same list uh, as as elders, with the one you know exception or distinction of being the teaching, the gift of teaching and preaching, um, which doesn't mean that some deacons don't have the gift of preaching and teaching. And if they do, then perhaps they may even be an elder one day. Cor- correct? Uh, I know men who have been deacons and then become elders. Uh, but I want to say and clarifying, it's not like a step process, like a job, and you're going to promote it. It doesn't mean because you're a deacon that you may ever become an elder. Uh, I would say most is not the case. But there are cases, right, where that can happen. Uh, someone could be a deacon. I was, I was asked to be deacon 15 years ago, you know what I mean, in, in the church that I was at, long before I ever knew I had a gift for teaching or thought that I could ever be a pastor or qualify to be a pastor. You can, you can have men that are deacons and then, you know, develop or start to understand that, that they have a gift for teaching. And the church recognizes that and says, you know, we'll join them as an elder. Um, but essentially the same list here. So, again, list for the elder, list for the deacons. Does that mean that only the elders and deacons should be living by these qualifications? I would say to you, every single one of us needs to strive to live by these qualifications. These are godly qualifications. If God calls for people to be this way, doesn't it make sense like that we should all strive? Shouldn't we all strive to be above reproach, to be blameless, uh, to be faithful in our marriage, uh, to lead our household well, uh, to not be given to, to wine or, or sordid gain or, or filthy lucre or all the list there? Shouldn't that be something that every one of us should strive to do? Of course it is. But to Jason's point about the double judgment, the accountability, all those things, that's the warning for you as a deacon, as an elder, to say, you better watch yourself according to these qualifications. Uh, I think of Paul, maybe it's Romans 13, 14, um, where he says, uh, I discipline my body and make it my slave. I know that's not what I'm thinking of. Um, 1 Corinthians, maybe, 927 is what that one was. So that's not right. Sorry, I want to get this right. It's Romans 13, 14. I'm pretty positive. I'm just quoting the wrong verse. But it's about... um, uh, That's not it. Oh, that was 12. 13, 14. Yeah, put on the Lord Jesus Christ uh, and make no provision for the flesh in regards to its lust. These kind of go hand in hand, so I'm mixing them up. Uh, it is 1 Corinthians, sorry. 1 Corinthians 9.27. But I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. So the goal for the elder and the deacon is you, you need to strive to not disqualify yourself uh, from these things. And so, um, again, good things to, for all of us to be putting in play. Um, overseeing some of the administration would be the third mark that I guess we'd give in that because, again, as they're helping and assisting in the eldership, uh, a lot of the ruling, right, a lot of the ruling, a lot of that, as you talk about the corporate business structure, as the church gets bigger, there's more of that. Uh, there's bookkeeping, there's paperwork, there's, you know, all this stuff that happens. You could get bogged down to where if I'm doing all of that, I don't have any time to, to do visit anybody, to pray with for nothing, and to study enough time, uh, enough study time. So, uh, so there's a lot of, of a lot of that stuff too. Um, Just to make myself, I heard clear. You said it was ten or fifteen years before you really got into preaching and being a deacon. So we got what? Five well, not ten. being a deacon, I actually never was a deacon. Oh, the, uh, sorry. So yeah, just for clarification, I was offered well, I was, and I was asked to be deacon at two churches, and yeah. I declined both. No, I, I was going to say. So if it was 
10 or 15, we got what, five or 10 for? Yes, <laughs> yes, good call, good call. Yeah, yeah, I never actually uh, was a deacon. I, I declined uh, those for, for other reasons, but um, yeah, good question, good thought. So yeah, Greg, if you heard Greg Jason, he's years. saying you got a couple more years before you got to, you know, step up to the plate of, uh, of preaching and teaching. But uh, no, I appreciate Greg. He well, has, he has to, uh, to keep studying. Yes. Uh, and I appreciate Greg. Yeah, and Greg has taught and filled in for me on Bible studies uh, yes. before, um, and, and as have other men too. Uh, you know, to give opportunities to do that. Um, but yeah, Greg, um, I don't know if you want to add anything to this. Uh, Greg Dully first, and then certainly uh, we can close with that. And any kind of other commentary and questions or comments. I think that I just have something to say before the, the other any Greg speaks. Um, it's just that servant's heart is what I see as Greg, and like. There's like a million things that Greg does that nobody ever sees or knows about other than like y'all. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, and that's really the servant's heart to just get those things out of the, you know, like you said, off yeah. the plate. Greg just says yes. Yeah, and it's, it's teaching or yeah. cleaning or and it's mind. amazing. And you know, guys, you guys know it takes way more than that. It takes a team because uh, Roseanne does a lot of that. Jill does a lot of that. Nancy does a lot of that. You know, kind of like the wife, not these, just these three. The things. wife it's thing, like uh, but. Uh, but just this, yeah, between me and Steve and Greg, it's it's the same kind of thing. Like you, like you talk about, it's just like in your family. Uh, how do the dishes get done? How do the laundry get done? How did the house get clean? How did this happen? That how, like I say to my kids often, like fairies don't come in here and wash the dishes, <laughs> at, at, you know, in the middle of the night. Uh, same thing like Brian and I tease around about around here. You know, like fairies didn't come in and put these tables together. Fairies just didn't come in every Sunday morning and and put everything together and clean it up and set it up uh, for for everybody to come in. To, to church service on Sunday uh, because what it looks like Sunday after they leave or what it looks like up here after Tuesday night is not what it looks like when you see right here. And so fairies don't come in and do that. People do that. And and the majority of it is the leadership, uh, you know, that's, that's doing that. And so I say that not to, to any way point to anything to me, but to point to Jill's point, to point back, uh, to use the word point as many times as I can, uh, to point to Greg uh, as a deacon to say, you're right. There are so many things that that he does, uh, which which is a great um, testimony of being a deacon. That there are so many things that he does and servitude that goes unnoticed yes. and and un uh, acknowledged, yes. under acknowledged. That you know we're not leading him up on the stage on Sunday morning no. to pin a gold star on his jacket, uh, but. But rest assured, brother, um, you, it doesn't go without notice uh, from God and that we are all going to be rewarded one day uh, in accordance to our works. So, uh, sorry, Greg, uh, you have the mic. Anything to add? Uh, amen to that, and thank you for the kind words. All the glory to God. Um, all I can tell you is it's been my absolute pleasure to serve, uh, serve God first and foremost, and of course, our, uh, our membership here at the church. Um, you know, we could always use more help, so always looking for volunteers. Uh, you know, Craig sells himself short. He he does most of the heavy lifting around here. Don't let him fool you. Um, and we're so very grateful for that. Um, you know, if it was God's will, I, I would love to, you know, quit my job and, and dedicate my time to it full time. And, you know, you know maybe, maybe that's God's plan for my life in the future, who knows? Um, He's, he's all knowing, and if that's, if, if, he can certainly do it if that's what he wants. Um, we got to see him. But, yeah, I don't know if you guys can hear me. Yeah, yeah keep going. Yeah. We can hear you. I'm just putting you on the screen now, so now we can see y'all. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so, yeah, that, that's, that's really it. I'm just very grateful to be here and uh, very grateful for the leadership that we have in this church. We, we are a very small church, but we're a very, very blessed church. Um, I count my blessings every day on the, the, the pastors that uh, have shepherded me at this church. Um, I, they're outstanding men. Um, you know, God is, you could truly see, you know, God has, has put his blessing on them. Um, I'm just very grateful to be here and to be able to serve the Lord. So, um, Amen. again, all the glory to him and and. Any way I can continue to serve is, is what I'm looking to do. And I pray each and every day that he'll free up more time or, you know, take some of my uh, uh, job, you know, actual job, you know, 
job that pays the bills responsibilities away yeah. so that maybe I can spend some more time at the church and, and who knows what that looks like. Yep. Um, but again, you know, always looking for volunteers. Uh, it, it takes uh, it takes everybody to, to, to make this thing work. Amen. And uh, it's just, uh, it, it's a pleasure to, to, to see the lives that are changed and touched. And uh, I mean, I don't know how many years, I don't know how long have I been with First Baptist, Craig? Do you even know? I don't remember. Um, I don't know. Brian lot, said but, he was, they were here, um, what, six yeah, and he, a half years? I think he I don't even know how long I've You were here before them, probably the seven years. Yeah, it's been a while, but just that even short time, whatever it's been, eight, ten years, eight years, something like that, seven, something like that. Um, it, it's just been amazing to see how God has touched so many people's different lives um, from every end of the spectrum. Um, so I'm just real happy to be here. Uh, it, it, I don't think I could ever move away just because I don't think I could be away from you all. So uh, God willing, we'll be able to stay here, too. So. Yeah, we should have told Brian that before he left. <laughs> uh, no, all good, man, because you're right. And it, again, the size doesn't even matter. It's just, you know, small, big. And you know what's funny is uh, I find myself always saying that too, you know, oh, a little church on the little islands of the Keys and small churches. And uh, just FYI, uh, we talk about that at our, I think it came up at our pastor's meeting um, a couple of months ago, you know, as we were all talking about churches and, oh, we're, yeah, but we're a small church. Like uh, the Southern Baptist Convention has like almost 50,000 churches. You know, the average size of churches, like 65 people. So as we think of like, we think, oh, we're so tiny and we're so small. It's crazy. I think it's under 70 still of 45 to 50,000 churches in the SBC. We just think of like big churches, uh, but it's not typical. Uh, the average is somewhere, you know, around 70. So um, anyways, I just said that in passing as he said that because I often say it too. And it really doesn't matter is the point. Like whether it's seven or 700, um, all the things that we're talking about tonight and that Greg's sharing, you know, about deacons and elders, but specifically what God's word says about, you know, the governance of the church, it's, it's going to be difficult if you're seven or 700 to do it if you're not doing it the right way. And, and if you're not doing the, the, the right way, then the Lord's not going to bless it how he would bless it, right? Uh, God appreciates obedience. He, he wants obedience. He wants, uh, we went through that, remember already, the regulative and normative principle of worship. Uh, he is the one who has told us how to worship him. He is the one who has told us how to structure the church. He's the one who told us uh, how to worship him in the congregation together in the church, and w what day to do it, how to do it, how to organize it. Like, all these things are written in his word for us. And so um, if we don't adhere to it, you know, there's going to be problems. And there's always going to be problems anyway, right? Because we're humans. And so there's going to be problems anyway. So uh, we don't need to, to, you know, contribute to the problems by, th think about Israel in the Old Testament and how they just kept compiling the problems because they were worshiping in the wrong way. And God doesn't like that, right? There's, uh, that's a big deal to God. When you're not sac they weren't doing the sacrifices right, or they're sacrificing to different gods, or, or uh, you know, they struck and killed Uzzah for, for carrying the cart of the ark wrong. Uh, we could just go on and on and on down the list to say it's about what God says and how he says he wants to be worshipped and how he wants us to, to behave and do that is what's important. And so, um, you know, when we have leadership that can try to keep that, proper and we have a congregation that is mature enough and knowing what it looks like to help the leadership keep it the way it's supposed to be uh then you know we can maybe help us stay on stay on track right because think about that as the congregation if the congregation is like corinth and they're immature and they don't know what's going on it's very easy for the church to get derailed because what if the the leadership of the church is also in that camp and they don't really know what they're doing and they're just kind of doing uh look we're just going to do what we feel or what we think is the right thing to do and if you don't have mature believers in the congregation you know it, it can it can really go sideways quickly so. or even some i know um well, i've heard and i know of some churches that they've been doing the same thing for 50 years and you know what? It ain't working, but they've been doing it 50 years the same thing. And then, you know, there's no, and then there's no maturity in the actual, um, the, the, the congregations, the congregation comes in and leaves, comes in and leaves. So, yeah. you know, it's that, 
there's, sure. there's no. But one thing that I did notice, and I was, it's going to sound a little bit weird, but here's the thing. You can have all the systems you want. You can have everything, like God said, this, elders, pastors, blah, blah, blah. blah. But the most important thing is the persons that are in charge of those things, even the even the congregation, if your heart is not right with God and your way of life is not right with God, yeah. it doesn't really matter. God put the guidelines, hey, yeah, you're going to have this, you're going to have that. But if the person is not born again, is sanctified, oh, yeah. I, it Certainly. really, like you said, it could just go the wrong Which way. Which goes back to, you know, you make a great point. Obviously, they got to be saved. Uh, you know, any one of the qualification there, it says not a new convert. Correct. <laughs> it says that because yeah. the man who's going to be an elder, and a de- or deacon, needs to be mature in the faith. Yeah, that, and that's where ordination comes in. That they need to be that needs to be recognized by people in the church. Um, that 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 this is the case. That yep, this is not a new convert. This is a sanctified believer. Right. Uh, we believe he fits the qualifications. We believe he has the gifts. Like. You know, these things need to be um, acknowledged and confirmed by by men in the church and by people in the church. Well, it said in the in the video that the elder had to oversee themselves. Correct. And then oversee the, the you family. know and the flock. Yeah. So it basically, first of all, you need like you have to put the oxygen mask on you yeah. first. Yeah. Yes, you like that. You put it on your kid. Hundred percent. Take care of yourself and your yeah. spiritual well-being, and you know Correct. where you're at before you. Can. And that's going to guard you from being a hypocrite, and like like that verse I was just reading to you about not disqualifying myself. Yeah. After I just preached to everybody else, I disqualify myself because I'm not I'm not you're doing that. You you right, right. And which again is is hard because every pastor is a human. Yeah. Every pastor is a man. Uh, you know, every biblical pastor is a man, uh, and and a, meaning a human being, it meaning struggles with sin and lust and pride and on and on and on down the list. So, uh, so essentially, in reality, the truth is we are hypocrites. I am a hypocrite because I do sin, uh, and I have sinned in doing the things that I preach on Sunday, saying don't do. And, and I do. And just like Paul says, the things I, I hate, I do. And the things I want to do, I don't do. And those are the things we're going to struggle with. But all everything you said is right. There's just there's not going to be perfection, but there's going to be, you know, it's got to continue to be in the right way. You've got to continue to deal with that by examining yourself first, preaching to yourself first, uh, guarding your life and watching yourself first so that you're trying to live Right as an example, the elders are trying to live to be examples to the people they're shepherding. Good. I know we're running behind, so we got to close. All right. Good stuff. Good stuff. Thank you. Thank you. Let's pray. Uh, uh, Greg, Nully, would you pray for us, please? Uh, Greg and Pam, I saw you were on mute, so I didn't know if you guys had any comments or were saying anything. Awesome. Always love you guys being here. Just seeing the faces and hearing y'all chime in is encouraging. I know it's tough on Zoom, uh, so again, we we all do our parts, and uh, it, it it's a work just to be on Zoom and, and join in because I know it's uh, it's not the same and it can be tough. So thank you for always being faithful in that. Awesome, thank you, Greg. If you'll close. Amen. This. Father God, thank you so much for bringing all of us together today. Uh, we lift everybody up in this room and their families. Uh, we ask you to hear all the requests that were made earlier today. You know our needs, Lord. Uh, thank you for sh- taking care of us so wonderfully. Uh, continue to strengthen us, to continue to put our trust in you, Lord. Uh, wipe away any anxieties, any fears. Continue to grow this church. Uh, bring the, the skills and the talent and the, the hearts that you need uh, to build your kingdom here in the Keys. Uh, or at least your church, I should say. And uh, we ask you to continue to bless over our pastors uh, as they make day-to-day decisions. We ask you to bless over Pastor Craig and his family. Keep him healthy and strong, Lord. Keep him close to you. Uh, Continue to grow him. Uh, Continue to open his eyes and ears. Continue to uh, bless him with the wonderful gift of teaching that you've given him. 
Thank you for all that you've given us. Mm -hmm. Praise you. We adore you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you, sir.